Hello, everybody, and welcome to Virtual English 2. My name is Paul Davidson, your English teacher, and this week we are going to be starting Critical Approaches to Literature. Uh, it's basically kind of the different ways that you can look at literature can get you different information from it. So there's not just, that's the thing that a lot of people hate about English, but that's a beautiful thing about English is that, like, as long as you can support your answer, you should be able to be, like, be correct. Like, there is not one definitive right answer. And y'all can at me all y'all want, but that's just how it works as a person with a master's degree in English. There's, like, so many different ways that you can look at English. So we're gonna, I'm going to tell you what critical approaches to literary theory is uh, today. And I'm just going to kind of walk you through what we're talking about whenever I'm talking about these different things. And then tomorrow we'll actually get the official assignment assignment. So critical approaches to literature. So here's what we're talking about. So things to keep in mind while we're interacting with this. Why do we study literature? And how does a viewpoint and bias affect our perception of reality? So like, there's a reason why we study literature. It's partly, partly because like we're all human and literature is a human like expression of how human beings act. Now, yes, uh, I know there's a lot of you who have different like career ambitions and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you're all human. You have to deal with ideas that deal with loss, inequality, uh, prejudice, uh, heartache, all that fun stuff. Uh, you all have to deal with that, uh, even if you are on both sides of the coin. So that's part of the reason why we study literature because literature is that human universality that we're going to try to tackle. I, all of you are human. So I had, I need to teach the human side of you and not just the, the economic benefiting society at arms of you. So, uh, critical approaches are different perspectives we consider when looking at a piece of literature. Uh, we seek to give, they, they seek to give us answer to these questions in addition to aiding and in interpreting literature. So they help us understand what do we read, why do we read, and how do we read. Now, we are going to look at three ourselves, but there are tons of these. So you have the reader response criticism. That's the one that you're probably the most familiar with. That's the one that uh, basically you say, you read this and tell us what you think about it. Then you have the sociological criticism. Now, sociological criticism actually has like seven or eight different criticisms within sociological criticism. Then you have the archetypical criticism. That's the uh, one that is super English teachery. Uh, if you ever hear English teachers being bemoaned as being simple hunters, this is where we kind of like beat a text to death trying to find the symbols within it, uh, which the, 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 it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes you can go a little bit too far with it, but sometimes like, yeah, like they're, these are archetypical symbols for a reason and you put them in here, maybe not intending it, but due to the fact that they have that symbolic significance usually associated with them, people's brains are going to jump to those conclusions. Those are the three that we are primarily going to look at. You also have a formalist or a literary criticism. That's the one where who says like the text is, uh, there's only one way to read the text and that's it. That's the only way. Those people are very fun to, have, to invite at parties. Then you have the sociological or social analytical criticism that's looking at through like a uh, Freudian uh, so socio analytical perspective. Uh, you look at like personality types, kind of what is this character's uh, uh, state, those types of things. Then you could also look at it through historic criticism. So you could look at the historical context that surrounded the publishing of the piece. And then you have the author, the author biographical criticism, you think where people believe that the is a reflection of the author's life. And so you can dive into the author's life and kind of get a good idea of why the author was writing this. Once again, there's no one right way of like approaching this. All of these are particularly valid. Just the formalist tends to be a little bit more esoteric and not necessarily as welcoming to new ideas. So let's start off with the reader response criticism. All right, I'll be right back. I need to grab a prop. So let's start off with the reader response criticism. Now the reader response criticism asserts that a great deal of the meaning of the text lies in how the reader responds to it. 
So this focuses on the act of reading and how it affects our perception of meaning in the text, how we feel at the beginning versus how we feel at the end. This deals more with more the process of creating meaning and experience as the text, as the text is a read, as we read. The text is an experience, not an object. The text is a living thing that the re that lives in the reader's imagination. So the reader plus the reading situation plus the text is how we get to the meaning. Now, each person is a different reader. Each person has a different reading situation. The text remains the same, but the other two are changing variables throughout all of this. And so as a result, different mean people will pull different meanings from the book depending on different things. Like I am a different reader and I have a different reading situation than I was. This is To Kill a Mockingbird, all right? I love To Kill a Mockingbird. I know some people like to bemoan it, but I personally like it. I understand that it can be problematic. I'm not gonna like outright defend it, but I do enjoy this novel. I think it is a good book. Now, I first read this when I was 13, 14 years old, and I've read it again like in my 30s. Each time I was a different person. I am not the same reader as I was 12 or 13. When I was 12 or 13, I identified more with Jim. Uh, now that I'm in my 30s, I identify more with Atticus. In fact, like the first, I have a couple of uh, pages like bookmarked here uh, a couple years ago started teaching I identified more with Miss Caroline and when I reread it for the first time in a long time and I was a first year teacher and I read Miss Caroline's experience I was like hey that's fairly accurate crying at your desk at the end of class <laughs> so yes uh even if you've already read a text uh your change since you last read that text. your reading situation is no longer the same and so as a result you're going to get a different meaning out of it so like a reader, like people who are like, I read this book, I read this, I don't read, it, I read it. You're a different person than you were when you read it last time. Even if you're not that drastically of a different reader, your reading situation has changed. And so each of those, just one of those elements changing will equal you to a different meaning. So that's what we're talking about with the reader response uh, is uh, just what you think. All those elements come together to help form your opinion of the text that you are reading. And that's one of those beautiful things like you have like you have your own re reading situation. You're all, you are your own reader. You bring your own different handbag of tools with you to constructing this text. And so as long as you can defend, uh, point to evidence, have a good warrant to back up your claims of what you think this text is trying to say, you're right, as long as you can defend it. That's the key. You have to be able to defend it. So here are two important ideas to remember with reader response. An individual reader's interpretation usually changes over time, as I doubt. Readers from different generations and different time periods interpret text differently. And it's ultimately, how do you feel about what you have read? What do you think it means? All right, so that is what the reader response is. Reader response is the most is the easiest one. It's the one that you have bring to yourself, like you are able to do it, but to do the fact that you could read, you read it. What'd you think? That's the reader response criticism. See, everybody can do it. Now we're going to get into the one that is a little bit more complicated, requires a little bit more calories, requires you to shift the way that you kind of frame the text uh, because with the reader response, you just show up and do it. The sociological approach, you're kind of looking at things from a different perspective. So sociological criticism argues that uh, the social context, so the social environment, must be considered when analyzing a text. This focuses on the values of society and how they, those views are reflected through the text, and it emphasizes economic, political, and cultural issues within literary text. The core belief is that the literature is a reflection of its society. So this is a mirror of society. That us reading these books or any pieces of literature, we are seeing our, our society being reflected back at us. Now, there are a variety of lenses that you can use in a sociological approach. And so basically, what you're going to do is you would take one of these lenses and place it on the text and see how that shapes it. And all of these apply. Even if it's not explicitly being talked about, the fact isn't being talked about is a way to think about the text. So you can look at it through a gender, a gender lens where you can see how does this text talk about men? How does this talk, text talk about women? 
Are they presented in a good way? Are they presented in a bad way? Why? What does it have to tell us about the way society treats men, the way the society treats women? Uh, the one that we're going to be doing, so later, spoiler alert, you're going to have a homework assignment involving you taking a sociological lens. Gender is probably the low-hanging fruit here, but there's other ones that you could possibly latch onto if you want. Then you also have socioeconomic status. What is this text saying about rich people? What is this text saying about poor people? What is this text saying about middle class people? Uh, what is the, like what is the reflection that this text is trying to tell us about those? And even if a, a even if poor people are not included in the text, what is that telling us about what uh, about poor people? Uh, same thing with rich people. What is it telling us about rich people since they've been not included? Then we have race. You have multiracial, indigenous, Latinx, uh, Asian, black, white, you name it. So what are these different, what is the text saying about these different races? Once again, if they are not, if the race is not present in the text, what is that trying to tell us? Sometimes there is a social like uh, understanding of why a race is included and why a race isn't included, but sometimes like they're being in excluded for a particular re for uh, intentionally. So that's something to keep in mind. You also have religion. You could rock, work with religion. You could look at what the text has to say about Christianity. What is this text trying to tell us about Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, etc.? Atheism too. Like that's another one you could look at. Uh, you could also look at uh, age. Age is a big one. What is this text trying to tell us about old people? What is this text trying to tell us about young people? Ability. So uh, people with different di disabilities. Able. What is this text trying to tell us about people who have disabilities? not included then why are these people being kind of shunned pushed to a corner of society and whatnot you also have sexual orientation what is the story trying to tell us about straight people what is this story about trying to tell us about gay people what is the story trying to tell us about uh, any of the other uh sexual orientations that are out there so that is kind of what we're talking about i'm not going to force y'all to pick any specific one of these uh you're open to whichever of these seven you want to go with you are going to have to pick one. I'm not going to force you to pick any of any of these in particular. In fact, here, I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to exit out. I'm going to stop sharing this so I can look you straight in the face and tell you that I am not forcing you to do any of those seven. You get to pick whichever those seven that you want. If you don't want to do one of those seven, you don't have to do it. I'm not forcing you to do it. I am making it an option. I'm not forcing you to take that option. All right? So that's a thing that you need to keep in mind. I'm not forcing you to that option. The option is there. You are like any of the other six that exist or any of the other ones that exist. You have to pick one, but you don't have to pick that specific one if you have that big of an issue with it, okay? I just want the record to show that I'm saying this right now to your camera. I, it's out there as an option. That doesn't mean you have to pick it. I'm not forcing you to pick it. Let's return to the lesson. All right. But that's that's what the sociological approach is, is basically kind of looking at these different sides of the coins. Uh, uh, the book is, the text is a reflection of society, saying about society. And if we can, are staring into it and we're not seeing that being reflected in society, what is that telling us? It's called reading against the text. It is a little bit more difficult to pull off, uh, but it is possible. If a text does not talk about it, there was possibly a it's being chosen to not be talked about. Then we have the archetypical approach. This approach focuses on using traditional literary archetypes, uh, so symbols to help understand the greater all, overall message of the text. I'll go over the handout here in a second, but that's what archetypical is. Now, remember, we will never look at a text strictly through one of these standpoints or another and ignore all other views. That is antithetical, antithetical of what we're trying to do. We should always keep our focus on the text and use these critical approaches to clarify our understandings of the text and develop our interpretation of it. Basically, you, you are using, you're not going to just use one of these. You're going to use all of these to help us build our understanding of what the text has to say. Okay, so... We went over the reader response. We went over the uh, sociological approach. Let's talk about the archetypal approaches. Now, there was a handout that I, that I mentioned, which I will have attached to this lesson. And you'll be using this to help your homework later on this 
week. Let me load it up and let me share it. So here are the archetypes that we were talking about. Uh, archetypes are just things that are kind of straw men that you're kind of like can put into any other situation. Uh, symbols are usually the big one that they go with. But basically it's just a, a lot of stories will follow the same beats. In fact, if you ever notice like, like there's this archetype for law and order. If you ever seen the TV show Law and Order, it will start off with people just t doing their day-to-day -day life being like, I'm just a garbage man. Bah. Oh no, there's a dead body. And then all of a sudden, like the detectives will show up and be like, uh, garbage man, uh, what did you see? I ain't seen nothing. But there's this person and like, yeah, if you ever watch Law and Order, it kind of follows this stereotypical, archetypical beat. And that's kind of what they have. They have an archetype that they kind of follow to plot out their episodes. That's what the same thing exists within literature as well. So here are a bunch of archetypical things that we're going to talk about. So we have situational archetypes. So these are like plots that would be recycled quite often. Uh, the biggest one that we're going to look at, uh, and we'll go even more in depth with this uh, next semester, or heck, maybe in this, I don't know, is the journey. The journey this is called the hero's journey. The journey is hero out to search for some truth of necessary to restore fertility, just for harmony to the kingdom. The journey includes a series of trials and tribulations the hero faces along the way. Usually the hero descends into a real or cycle of hell and is forced to discover his truths quite often concerning his faults. That once the hero is lowest level, he must accept a personal responsibility to return to the world. Uh, so basically the journey is the hero goes on this adventure. Uh, they start off in their ordinary world. They go into the special world where they have to prove that they are a hero. They reach their lowest point and they had to pick themselves back up to defeat the big bad person, grab the treasure and return home and restore normalcy to uh, society. This one is the, probably the, one of the more popular ones at the moment. Any superhero movie that you watch follows the journey. That's what it is. Every superhero movie is a, is a hero's journey. So the, that's part of the reason why we kind of focused on in on that one. And once again, these are all just different plots that could uh, be used. You have also the ritual, not to be confused with the initiation, that refers to an organized ceremony that involves an honored member being given a community, uh, com given a community, and a niche, an initiate. This situation brings the end or one of the community's adult world. You also have the fall, uh, not to be confused with the awareness of the initiation. This archetype describes a descent in action from a higher to a lower state of being. Uh, the experience might include defilement, moral imperfection, and or the loss of innocence. This often, fall often is accompanied by an expulsion of, from a kind of paradise penalty uh, for disobedience or moral transgression. Uh, but there's all kinds of these. Uh, you had death and rebirth. You had nature versus the mechanical, mechanical world, the, ba the battle between good and evil. Uh, these are all different ones that could, could fit uh, a plot. So any, uh, like any of the, any of these are ones that are fairly popular to be recycled. You'd have a story that would follow all the beats of what they're being described here. All right, then you have a symbolic types. These are just symbols that will often over time, uh, light versus darkness. So light usually suggests hope, uh, renewal or intellectual illumination. Dark implies the unknown, ignorance, despair. Uh, water versus desert. Water is uh, necessary for life and growth and is commonly appears as a birth or rebirth symbol. Water is used in baptism services, solemnizes spiritual births. Similarly, the appearance of rain in a work of literature can suggest the character to birth. If they're in a desert, de desert is death all around you, kind of. Uh, you have heaven versus hell, haven versus the wilderness, uh, supernatural intervention, fire and ice. Fire represents knowledge, life, rebirth, while ice represents like the, uh, like the desert, ignorance, darkness, sterility, and death. Colors. Colors are often really easy symbol symbols to jump onto. You have black, which is represents chaos, mystery, the unknown, before existence, death unconscious evil 
You have blood, which represent or blood red that represents blood, sacrifice, violent passion, disorder, sunrise, fire, emotion, wounds, death. It can also represent death, sentiment, mother, Mars, the note C, anger, excitement, heat, and uh, physical elation. Green represents hope, growth, envy, earth, fertility, sensation, vegetation, death, also water, nature, sympathy, adaptability, growth, Venus, and the note G and envy. Notice how none of these are actually like, they're, they're, these are fairly broad. And so you can kind of attach what you need to. White uh, represents purity, peace, Innocence, goodness, spirit, morality, creative force, the direction east, and spiritual thought. Orange represents fair pride, ambition, egoism. Uh, Venus, the note D. Blue represents the clear sky, the day, the sea, height, depth, heaven, religious feeling, devotion, innocence, truth, spirituality. Violet represents water, nostalgia, memory, advanced spirituality. Gold represents majesty, sun, wealth corn, life defense, truth, and then silver represents the moon or wealth. Now, uh, whenever we're talking about these colors, if a uh, author mentions this color, like goes out of their way to really like emphasize one of these colors, they could be embedding some of these symbolic uh, attitudes with that color. You're going to have to use the rest of the context of the story that's going on to help you understand that. Same thing can be done with numbers. Uh, like the number three can stand for the Trinity, uh, mind, spirit, body, birth, life, and death. So the, the human brain loves three. So you'll see threes pop up quite a bit through story. four represents mankind, the four elements, the four seasons, six represents the devil or evil. And then seven equals divinity, the relationship between God and man, the seven daily sins, the seven days of the week, the seven days to create the world, the seven stages of civilization, seven colors of the rainbow, Etc. Uh, once again, uh, it'll be there will actually mention these numbers and they'll go out of their way to kind of bring them up. And so that's the thing to keep in mind. Thing with the shapes, there's a variety of different shapes that could go, work with. Same thing with nature, there's a variety of different na nature natural symbols that could work. Then we have character archetypes. These are kind of like the stereotypical things that you would expect from a character. So. These are the ones that you're probably going to encounter more often than not. Uh, often uh, there's this in literature there in literature, there are a variety of different types of characters. You have the protagonist who's the main character who we kind of follow along. And then you have foils, which are supporting characters that help highlight something in the protagonist. Uh, the key foil is the antagonist, which is the foil that's standing in the way and complement complicating the protagonists from getting their success or their failure, but you have also smaller uh, foils that are just there to kind of highlight something. And a lot of those foils supporting characters will fall into these types of archetypes. So the first one is the hero. In its simplest form, this character is one uh, who ultimately may fulfill the necessary task to restore fertility, harmony, and justice to a community. The hero character is one who typically experiences the initiation, who goes to the community's uh, ritual, etc. He or she often will embody uh, characteristics of the young person from the provinces, the initiate, the initiate wisdom, the pupil, and the son. So the hero is per pretty much usually the protagonist, the main character. The person, uh, the young person from the provinces, this is a hero who is taken away as an infant or youth and raised by stranger, he, strangers. He or she later returns home as a stranger and able to recognize new problems with new and new solutions. Then you have the initiates. These are a group of heroes who prior to the quest must endure some tra training or ritual. They're usually innocent at this stage. Uh, there was a book that I read a couple of years ago called Brother Band, which is about of a bunch of kids that were kind of learning to be Vikings and whatnot, and they were initiates. That would be their stereotype, their archetypical uh, thing they would find. Mentors. These are individuals who serve as teachers or counselors to the initiates. Uh, sometimes they work as role models, often serve as a father or mother figure. They teach by example and the skills necessary to survive the quest and the journey. So basically they're an older person there to help the uh, initiates of hunting companions. This is usually, uh, these are usually foils. 
these uh, loyal companions will be, fa will be faced with any number of perils in order to come together. So let's, uh, all right, so let's do the, uh, let's do the, oh, uh, the superhero thing. All right, y'all know more movies. So any superhero really is usually the hero. The young person from the provinces, they're taken away as an infant and raised by strangers. He or she later returns home and able to recognize new problems. You could argue that the young person from the provinces is kind of along the lines of like a, like technically, I guess Loki would be that, even though Loki's kind of a bad guy, but he is taken away and raised by strangers. The initiates, uh, that would be the people that Thor grew up with, kind of like uh, his hunting party originally. The mentors, so like uh, the mentor for Thor would be, uh, I'm spacing on Odin's name, Odin. Odin would be kind of the mentor for Thor. Or uh, you could look at like Tony Stark would be kind of the mentor for Spider-Man. Uh, the group of hunting companions, it's shift to Spider-Man. The group of hunting companions, these loyal companions will face any number of perils in order to be together. That'd be like Spider-Man and his one friend uh, who knows who he, that he's Spider-Man in the new movies. The loyal retain or, or uh, like if we go back to Thor, Thor's, uh, Thor's hunting party, his people that he went out and like bashed skulls with, that would be his hunting group of loyal companions. The loyal, the loyal retainers, these are individuals who are notable sidekicks to the hero. Their duty is to protect the hero. They often retain, uh, retain, retainer reflects the hero's nobility, similar to the hunting group of companions. Uh, the friendly beasts, these are animals who assist the hero and reflect that nature is on the hero's side. So Aquaman, he has all the fishies. Uh, the friendly beasts would be the fish that help out Aquaman. Uh, the devil figure, this character represents evil incarnate. He or she would uh, offer worldly goods, fame, and knowledge to the protagonist in exchange for possession of, of their soul or integrity. This figure's main aim is to oppose the hero in his or her quest, Loki. The evil figure will ultimately a good heart. Uh, this is this redeemable devil figure or servant to the devil figure is saved by the hero's nobility or good heart. Loki, I guess, could also apply to that. The scapegoat, an animal or more usually a human whose death often is a public ceremony, an excuse or some taint or sin that has visited upon a community. This death often it makes the theme more powerful and for forces the hero. Uh, like this is one that you might want to consider later on. Uh, the outcast, a figure who is banished from the community for some crime, real or imagined. The outcast is usually destined to become a wanderer. The Earth Mother, this character is symbolic to fulfill, fulfillment, abundance, fertility, offers spiritual or mo emotional nourish, nourishment, and she, uh, who is, she contacts and is often depicts with Earth colors and, you know, that part. The Temptress, ooh, the Temptress is characterized by a sensuous beauty. She is one whose physical attraction may bring the hero's downfall. That is a very sexist one. Uh, the platonic ideal this source often uh inspir this source of inspiration often is physical and spiritual ideal of whom the hero uh, has an intellectual rather than a physical attraction you have the unfaithful wife the woman who is married to a man who seems uh, dull or distant and is attracted to a more virile or interesting man uh that is also sexist but that's one that often gets brought up Damsel in Distress is the one that needs rescued, once again sexist. Uh, the Star-Crossed Lovers, two characters who are engaged in a love affair that is fated to end in tragedy for one or both of them due to the disapproval of society, friends, uh, family, or the gods, Romeo and Juliet, and then the creature of the night. This monster or physical or abstract is summoned from the, de the deepest, darkest parts of the human psyche to threaten the lives of the hero or heroine is often is uh, perver pervasive and desecration of the human body. Okay, and a bunch of other ways that you could possibly recognize patterns. So that's all I got for you today. Just watch this, kind of learn what these different approaches are. So remember, reader response is you plus your reading situation plus the text equals what you pull out of it. You have sociological uh, approaches, which is basically how does uh, the text reflect society via one of those se seven things, which were gender, race, religion, uh, capability, sexuality, um, 
I'm spacing on the other ones off the top of my head. Uh, uh, age was another one and ability. I think I already said ability though. And then the archetypical approach, which is basically uh, here are a bunch of traditional like archetypes that happen throughout stories. Uh, you'll see these happen quite often. It's they're pretty ubiquitous. How are, how is the story using that archetype to get their point across? All right. Uh, tomorrow I'll be back with the actual assignment. I'll walk you through how to do the actual assignment. But today, all you have to do is just watch me teach you about archetypes. That's all you had to do. All right. I will see you all tomorrow. If you have any questions, email me pdavidson at portagel.k12.mo.us. See you later. Bye-bye.